Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us. This is so great to see this many converts just from having uh, a morning session talking about Brian Palermo on a slide with uh, Pee Wee. So um, I, uh, you all know who I am. I'm, I'm just going to briefly introduce Brian and give you some context. So uh, nearly 25 years ago, um, at least more than 20 years ago, um, when I was getting my master's degree, I decided for a lark to take an improv theater class and uh, thought it would be a nice way to meet people and so forth. And the first day of class that I went to, uh, we were all introducing ourselves and one of the other uh, women in the class said, I know this sounds a little corny, but uh, one of the things I really love about taking improv is that it's a lot like life. And, I, and that stuck with me because I did think it sounded a little weird. Um, but what I discovered in the course of taking this class that is, was that it was true. And, and because at the time I was studying software development for educational software, it got me really intrigued in, the, in how was this um, a, a tremendous creativity that was happening among these improvisational theater actors uh, translated, could it, how could it be translated into uh, the work that I was seeing that was not so inspired in the area of educational technology at the time. And it got me so interested that I actually ended up taking a class on Teams and uh, then deciding to get a PhD in organizational behavior, studying collaboration, and specifically looking for some of these characteristics of what it is that improvisers do that make a uh, project, I mean, uh, what they do on the stage, how that's successful. And it turns out that there are several key principles, which I believe that Brian will be talking about today, we'll that see. make it, yeah, we've, we'll find out. But it makes it relevant both um, for teamwork, for communication, for creativity, uh, for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary projects, working across boundaries and so forth. And um, I was very excited when I saw that uh, Randy's book uh, had mentioned improvisation. Um, but also that when I asked him if he would come, he said, well, w could I bring my, my uh, colleague, Brian Palermo? And I thought, oh, this is just super awesome. So I'm really delighted to have him here to talk with you and do some um, uh, interactive activities with you. And I hope that you get as much out of it as I, uh, I think you probably will. Cool. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everybody, or good after, whatever. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian. I took off my little tag because it was annoying me. Um, Thank you for coming. Uh, there will be some little tiny improvising exercises shortly, but to uh, lessen the anxiety, no one's gonna get up here and do a monologue or anything stupid. So don't, uh, don't freak out, try to lessen that anxiety. Uh, I will invite you to play a couple of games from your chairs and stand up and, and partner for 30 seconds at a time. It's not a big ask for you. And if you're really uncomfortable with it, you can say no and just stay seated. Um, I think we'll probably uh, force you to do it, but we'll see. All right. So. Uh, I always like to start in the science community uh, by saying thank you for coming to attend. Thank you for giving me a chance here. I am not a scientist. I'm a science fanboy. I love what you do. I respect what you do. I think it's really amazing in many, many ways. And that's how uh, Randy wrote me into this 10 years ago because I was curious about science and I was kind of fascinated with you know the stuff that he did and other things that scientists do that as a layman, I do not have the experience of, but I'm very interested in. So just thank you for coming. I I appreciate you. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds on, on uh, my acting stuff just to validate the fact that I am an actor in Hollywood for the past 20 years. Uh, this is me uh, pretending to be a computer science professor at Harvard in the movie Social Network. So this is as close as I will ever get to your actual world. Um, uh, Steve Carell is another improv guy I'm going to show shortly, but we did a, a show called Riot that at the time was the fastest canceled show in the history of the Fox Network. <laughs> I did a uh, I did the Tonight Show a lot when Leno had it in Los Angeles. I probably did 15 or 20 appearances on the Tonight Show, and that's a little modern family thing. For novelty's sake, that was one scene. I had maybe four lines, but you get paid, you get residuals, and you can show people that you were on Modern Family. So this is what I've done primarily for the past 20, 25 years. I'm an actor. Um, Randy, 10 years ago, asked me to come and teach some improv techniques, just some loose exercises for a lot of science communicators up in Los Angeles. And uh, it was people from Heal the Bay and Surfrider, a lot of marine biology, because that's where he had come from originally when he was a, uh, an actual scientist before he was a filmmaker. So uh, Randy got me into this world of teaching improv exercises 
to bolster communication, specifically in the science world. So uh, that was him, but you all know him from the keynote. We did write this book together uh, with the co-author, Dory Barton. So the three of us wrote uh, Connection, Hollywood Storytelling Meets Critical Thinking. We thought, we'd say, let's get, how do we get the theatrical and the humanities side of in, in improving your communications, but also make sure it's, it's rigorous and robust, as you people like to say so much. Uh, so critical thinking got thrown into that title there. So I've done a lot of work on how improv applies to communications uh, writ large and more specifically to science communication. Uh, some of the science clients I've had over the past 10 years, this is really just a sampling. I'm happy to say that I, I work quite a bit in this world. I do most uh, work at JPL for the past few years. They've had me on kind of a retainer. So I work with a lot of rocket scientists, literally. I don't know if you guys look down on them. There's a lot of interdisciplinary rivalry, uh, even within the, Actually, this brings up a collaboration note. Even within the JPL, I, I've been brought in to work with teams where the biogeochem lady doesn't get along with the rocket telemetry guy who doesn't want to uh, sub, uh, be subservient to the program manager. People have egos, you might be surprised to hear. And uh, <laughs> rightly so, to a great degree. If you've got five, de five degrees, no pun intended, no uh, reference intended, then you're an expert in your field. And sometimes experts in different fields don't like to play nice together, and then they don't get funded by the Pentagon, and then they call in some actor to teach them how to be a better communicator. Uh, anyway, Aslo is a, a, a limnology and oceanography, so blah, 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 blah. I do a lot of science stuff. I've also done a lot of co uh, corporate clients over the years. I just throw that up there to, again, sort of validate that improv training is becoming ubiquitous. Everybody recognizes the value of it, and this is a very, very small sample of what I've done over 20 years in the corporate world. Uh, I also teach improv for theatrical comedic purposes. I come from a, uh, a school called the Groundlings Theater in Los Angeles, and uh, I won't mention too much about that. Now, Talking to Catherine, uh, prior to today's uh, uh, workshop, we identified some of the challenges, and it's basically what, what Catherine gave me, and as, as I understand them. You know, in Gateway specifically, in e-science, a lot of your challenges might deal with this. How do you articulate that gateways are important? How do you distill the science to be understandable? Uh, how do you build consensus? Again, a lot of this comes down to interdisciplinary communications and interdisciplinary collaboration, right? And the last thing is bridging between jargon and specialized uh, knowledge of disciplines, again, interdisciplinary stuff. So these are some of the problems, as Randy would say in the ABT, and then the solution is going to be a little bit of improv training for you. But first thing we're gonna do is an exercise together from your chairs. You don't have to get up, you don't have to move, you don't have to warm up, you have to do nothing, all right? We're gonna improvise a story together. Myself being one part of it, and you as entirety as a group being the second part of it. Your job here is very easy. All you have to do is say yes, but it's got to be loud and clear. So I'm going to offer a piece of information, and you've got to say yes to that. Let's try a practice. One, two, three. Yes. Excellent. Be even louder if you want. This is the uh, opportunity to uh, really show it all. Okay. So shall we improvise a story together? Yes. Is it about an alien who comes to Earth? Yes. Does the alien save a bunch of orphans from the orphan fire? The orphan fire. Uh, does he take him out to uh, pancake breakfast? Yes. Congratulations. We've just improvised a story together. All right. So that's how easy that goes. Now let's try the opposite to continue the experiment and show you how it works when uh, uh, the other, other uh, form is employed. You say no this time, every time. All right. We'll see how this story grows. Shall we tell a story together? No. Well, that's the end of that. <laughs> no alien, no pancakes, no orphans. Uh, I'm sorry. I prioritize pancakes over orphans, but that's how, what happens in uh, a no. And sadly, you guys are in a culture of no. This is just kind of my, Brian's nonsense version of all of science. It, as it pertains to today's communication stuff, it's a, it's a culture of no. Science needs to have rigorous and robust experimentation. And it, the null hypothesis, as I understand it, says there is no connection between anything until it's proven and uh, published and uh, recreated and all these, all these very important things for science. Very important, vital for science. You, you've got to have all this no in order to get to the, the truth horrible for communication, all right? So you're assuming there's no connection between anything until it's proven. Well, having a connection with another human being is how you message effectively, is how you communicate effect effectively, how you cooperate and collaborate effectively. You've got to have that connection. That's why we titled our book, Connection, right? So where are you coming from? You, I'm sure, don't even realize it most of the time, but there's a lot of no in the world of science and academia and just linear thinkers, logical thinkers, sensible people, reasonable people, <laughs> all come from a lot of no. 
Uh, quick anecdote, my nephew, who is a, a C student, to be polite, he was, he was not a good student uh, in high school. Uh, he was always BC student, that's fine. Um, uh, came home, he had a 95 on some test. I don't know, but he got, it was the first time he'd gotten a 95. I think it was the first time he ever got in the 90s. Showed it to his dad, uh, and his dad said, uh, here's when you went wrong. Let me show you what's wrong. He's a civil engineer. So what happens is, uh, engineers, logical thinkers, I'm lumping you all in, I know I'm generalizing, look for a problem so that they can help. So my brother-in-law is just offering a solution. It's like, you got a 95, here's the one problem you got wrong. Let me tell you how you can fix that one thing and then you'll be perfect or you'll you know, step towards perfection. Um, but what my nephew wanted was just, I got a 95 for the first time. How about a little pride? How about a little satisfaction? Just give me a atta boy. And what happened was he just shut down. My nephew was just so disappointed by dad's reaction. And my brother-in-law is a loving dad. He's a great guy, but his mind was, the first thing he sees is the problem, not the 95, which was a huge improvement, right? So uh, we could talk all day about what a jerk my brother-in-law is, but the point is, <laughs> it's very easy to fall into this filter of, here's your problem. And guess who doesn't want to communicate like that? Everybody who's not a scientist, and everybody who's not you, right? Nobody wants you to just stand there and tell you, here's your problem, right? So this idea of the culture of no, it comes from a good place. and and. I'll say historically, I, I know I'm talking to scientists, so you guys will check me on a lot of stuff, but generally, uh, scientists have not been emotional and they've, they've not been very forthcoming in, 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 with their emotions. They just look for the, the need. They look for the problem so they can help fix it. This is what I respect. This is what's good about it. And it works against you in communication. All right, so that's kind of a big theory that I'm throwing out. And uh, I would say that's the problem and we're gonna uh, address it. With today's goal, the solution is a little bit of improv, a little bit of culture of yes, right? So in theatrical improv, you have to say yes to everything, whether you like it or not. That's how, that's how a scene gets built. If you say no, just like we did in our story, nothing else gets, gets built, nothing else happens, right? So uh, today's goal is just to throw some communication techniques at you, really just uh, uh, an introduction to some things that will apply to uh, better communications challenges. This is a guy named Will Ferrell. This is a lady named Amy Poehler. This is just a little list of some uh, uh, famous actors, Mike Myers, Melissa McCarthy, Tina Fey, who is uh, Steve Carell, Steve Colbert, giving you a little dance, and uh, four out of the five bridesmaids were all improvisers. Now, why I, I show that, what's important about that, there's, they're funny people, they're talented people. Uh, personally, they might be charming people. I, I, I do know some of them, which is gross to name drop, but I don't know all those people. Um, the point here, the pertinent uh, bit of information is that they're all improv, uh, improvisers, and they're all trained improvisers. They've done it for years and decades. I've been improvising for 30 years myself. However, I'm not as talented as them, so I'm teaching you at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday. <laughs> However, this is, called, this is called truth and honesty, kids. All right, so authentic, authenticity. All right, so they're all trained improvisers and they might be, again, uh, extroverted. Their personality might lead towards uh, being a better performer or communicator in that sense. But what's important is they've all been trained with, with improv exercises and they practiced it for years and years and decades, truly. And that's a big part of what helps them connect to audiences and it's a big part of what makes them so successful. These happen to be improvisers who are all comedic, and I realize that. That's kind of the only people, the only big people that are out there that are improv. Randy had mentioned Alan Alda, who is an improv performer, became a, a, a big star, television star on MASH, and then got into the science world, so he brings a big name of improv to science, but everybody else in improv basically comes from comedic theatrical performance. I am not going to suggest that for you guys. I am going to suggest some improv training as a way to bolster your communication skills. So uh, all of us can go out and play uh, golf today, but none of us are gonna be Tiger Woods. You know, you can learn some of these techniques and apply them to uh, help yourself. We're not expecting you to be a movie star. Is that fair to say? Yeah, great, sure, why not? All right, so what do improvisers excel at? All those people and others in the world. Listening, okay, not just hearing, but listening to understand and not to respond. So that's a quote from Stephen Covey, who's an author, Covey, I may be pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Covey, thank you. Um, so listening to understand, not listening to respond. Hi, come on in. Uh, don't, don't let me scare you, I'm so loving, I'm, I'm, you want me to hug you? Come in, all right. Go in the back, go in the back. I want that man removed. All right, so um, 
listening, listening to understand, not just to respond. If Catherine and I are doing an improvised scene, a theatrical scene, she might open by saying, good morning, Grandpa. I brought donuts for the bake sale, right? As I'm listening, as soon as she says Grandpa, that's the first thing that's, that's got some meaning to it. It's only the second word, but it's, it's got more meaning than hi or good morning or whatever I said. So I start formulating a response. Humans often do this. I'm, I'm listening now to whatever else comes out of Catherine's mouth. I just want to respond my way. So I'll go off the grandpa thing and I'll completely miss donuts bake sale, right? Whereas that's what Catherine is, offer, Catherine is offering is this bake sale scene. If I'm listening to her all the way through the end, I'll get that information. I'll understand that is what she's offering and then we can work together better. If I just reactively respond or just wait for her to stop moving her lips so I can say my thing, then I'm not understanding my partner and it puts you automatically at a disadvantage. So improvisers excel at listening to understand as opposed to just responding. Also using heightened emotional intelligence. Uh, this is big because in the science world, you've been trained out of it or you naturally are not inclined to it. I get a lot of feedback about uh, some people go into the sciences specifically so they don't have to interact with other human beings. I, I get that. Uh, you don't have to be an extrovert. These are going to be little techniques that might help you. But the idea of emotional intelligence. Humans, this is evolutionary biology as, uh, as an actor understands it. So don't come at the end of the thing and say you're wrong about everything. I get it, right? Anecdotal generalizing. Evolutionary biology says that uh, humans respond immediately because we were trained as we were evolving. You know, if there's a noise in the bushes, you, you get startled and you run or, or whatever, because it's, if it's a bear, it's gonna kill you, right? So those who don't react immediately are no longer in our gene pool. So <laughs> reading emotions on someone's face, this goes from the bear to the, ah, I'm running, and other people in the tribe see he's running, he's scared, let's all, all run too, or we're all gonna get eaten by the bear. All right, so uh, the emotional content of, or the emotional context rather, of, of your information is extremely important to sharing it with other people, whether interpersonally, in a lab with colleagues, or broadly to lay people, to others, just people at your family uh, Thanksgiving party. If you don't want them to tune out of you, you're gonna take some of these tips away. Uh, so the idea of emotional intelligence, not only recognizing others, but utilizing some yourself. And we're gonna do a tiny exercise on each of these uh, points in a moment. Third is yes and. Yes and is the operating system of improv. I thought of that while I was brushing my teeth. I never used that phrase, but I thought that might fit here for you guys. Think of your audience, put, 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 put the focus on the other person. I usually say uh, yes and is the bottom foundation guideline of improv, but I think OS is probably more uh, accurate actually. So I may be using that forever, thank you for that. Uh, yes and, that means in improv, no matter what your partner says, you must agree with it, yes. And you must add to it, and. All right, so is there an alien? Yes, and he saved the orphan, and they went to pancakes, whatever. So you must agree with whatever's in front of you and then add to it. Um, obviously, this is not an algorithm. You cannot do this in the real world. You cannot do this if your child asks you if they can jump on a lawnmower upside down. You, know, you can't say yes to everything. What, what this does is it establishes an orientation of agreement. So even if you are not capable of literally saying yes to someone, you wanna be in that orientation of agreement with them so that's at least subconsciously, you know, I'm working with you. I want to cooperate. I want us both to get something out of this interaction, whatever it might be. You always have your agenda, sorry, your agenda of uh, getting your message across. But if you do it with just the idea of, uh, what do they call that one? Uh, uh, data, not there, what do you call it? Um, somebody's talking, oh, deficit, uh, the deficit model. So if A uh, realizes that B doesn't know something and A just says a bunch of data in front of B because that was their deficit, now that I've said it, oh, now they get it, right? How does that work in the real world? It does not, all right? So using active listening and emotional intelligence and this orientation of agreement where you've got it underneath, that it's like, I want to work with you, that helps your uh, messaging get across. It helps you be more effective and efficacious, which is one of your words. All right, so these three things we're gonna look at with a couple of exercises. And the first one we're gonna do is frame communication. The idea of knowing your audience, which Randy mentioned earlier, and I just said uh, operating system of improv, right? I'm trying to uh, come up with analogies or stuff that will connect with you better. So the framing is never just, did I say what I wanted to say? And I get a lot of feedback from uh, students and grad students and early career scientists who are still 
defending a, a poster or, or a doctoral thesis or just having to do presentations and they're petrified and they don't want to do them and they just learn their speech by rote and they figure if after the fact I said what I wanted to say, I said what was on my card, done, right? That's not an effective way. So you don't want to frame it in, in that sort of mindset of did I say what I wanted to say? You want to frame it this way, is did they hear what I need them to hear? That's a more effective way of framing this stuff. And uh, it, that applies to anything, whether it's, it's really high-end information, technical information, uh, putting together a gateway, trying to, to form a panel, whatever it might be, the they involved there are kind of more important to your framing of your own communication. So it's not about just what I want to say. It's like, did I put it in a form that they will understand? And that way it's more actionable for them, which is probably going to serve you. All right, so that's a little framing thing. Let's go back to this listening exercise. So, uh, Catherine, did you come up and do a demo for me? We're going to do a, a really short listening exercise. This is uh, Catherine did not know I was going to ask her up here. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's all set up. Don't worry about it. So, do that dance that we talked about. Okay, uh, this is a <laughs> this is a listening exercise called Last Letter. How it works is I am going to say a word, any word, such as projector, pen tablecloth, it doesn't matter, a word. Catherine will have to listen to me and determine that last letter of that, that word. Let's use tablecloth as the example, an H. She'll have to think of a new word that begins with that last letter and then give that back to me. So give me a word that begins with H, please. Hello. Hello. So I can determine last letter is, oh, I would say ocelot. Terrible. Thank you for your judgment. All right, so uh, <laughs> culture of no. Scientists go straight to the negative. All right, Jesus. What do you have against ocelots? All right, so now, now the arms are crossed. Now there's a lot of defensiveness. Now there's a lot of protecting. <laughs> I've seen people protect their crotches. It's like, it's, it's just, it's a word game, people. Calm down. It's a word game. Now, we're going to do a couple more of these to demo it, and then I'm going to have you guys stand up in pairs and do it yourself. So this is just a demonstration of it. The idea here is it's not a Freudian game. This is not a stream of consciousness where you're, well, the terrible thing was a bit pointed, but, uh, <laughs> It's not the content of this exercise. It's the mechanics of this exercise. The idea of I cannot determine what my next offering is going to be until I know what the last letter is. I cannot know what the last letter is until I actively listen to my partner all the way through, you know, a, two syllables, whatever, the, whatever the word might be, right? So let's just do a couple of quickies and then I'll send you on your way. Why don't you start? Uh, greenhouse. Um, eagle. Evergreen. Nigeria. Animal. Great, excellent. Let's give Catherine a round of applause. Yay! You are brilliant. Get off of my stage, Catherine. It's not about you. All right, now, I want everybody to stand up and turn to a partner, pair up. It could be trios if there's a weird uh, uh, shaping. We're going to do this exercise, maybe a minute. It's, it's, a, it's a tiny exercise. So as you face each other, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a little commanding just because we don't have that much time. As you face each other, decide who is A and who is B. A is gonna be the starter, it doesn't really mean anything. All right, stay with me guys, stay with me. Now, please focus up here, you're not started yet, you're not started yet. I, oh, I love, I love that you jumped in. I just wanna make it clear, so A will begin with any word, uh, uh, B will listen to that last letter. If you get five silent E's in a row, just go with the last sound of it. This is not a spelling game. Most people wanna prove how smart they are about the spell, I don't care about the spelling, all right? Do listen to that last sound. So A will begin with any word, we'll go back and forth for maybe a minute and then I'll call it there. Any questions on the mechanics of this exercise? Great, let's have all the A's begin. Face your partner, go. All right, let's stop it there, yes! Have a seat, have a seat. So I love, I love all the friendly and uh, convivial chit chat afterwards, but I'll come back to you. I, I've got to go somewhat quickly to get some stuff out there. So let's bring it back after an exercise, uh, come back to me. Was there a question? 
Uh, no, very, very hard. No, it, he doesn't need a catheter. It's just, yeah. uh, sit on off a lot. It's okay. We got you. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm teasing yeah, Catherine like we've been best friends forever. I met her yesterday. I, you know, it's more. All right. Uh, no, I don't have a lot of tricks, and I realize it's a very noisy room. This, again, is, is uh, uh, an introduction to some uh, exercises here. This is not going to be best practices on how to do it. But I will take an extra second uh, to ask, and this is an internal, I don't have time to get into everybody's therapy, but internally, uh, how did you feel about that exercise? Was it, A, it's usually a little bit fun because you don't do such things at, at science conferences, and you got to stand up for Christ's sake, it's all yay. Um, but a lot of people give me feedback after the fact that, they wanted to prove how smart they were. So they want to come up with the best words. So what, whatever, right. So whatever, whatever word they got, they're then scrolling through their brain, trying to come up with the most syllables they possibly can and or something that is specific to their discipline that you won't get, right? So <laughs> that happens in our human brains. And again, with all of it, it's universal, but it's a little bit more challenging with people in the science world because uh, you've got five syllable uh, words. So you've got words that are jargon specific to you that might throw somebody out. So that's one thing you might have experienced. I'm not gonna get into it. Another thing is some people feel really defeated by this. If they can't think of a word quickly, they think, oh Jesus, I'm dumb. I, this, this guy, this guy, he got canceled on a show by Fox faster than anybody and he's fast with the word. It doesn't, you don't do this game, right? So I don't expect you to be uh, adept at it right off the bat. The content, whatever words you came up with, uh, eagle in Nigeria and ocelot and tablecloth, the content is pretty meaningless. The mechanics are important. The idea of listening to your partner with the intent to understand them as opposed to listening to respond. And often I'll get the feedback that, yeah, I, 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 if I'm being honest, when I'm interacting with a colleague, I'm just kind of nodding my head and, and smiling and waiting for them to shut up so I could say my thing. You know, that's how a lot of humans communicate. And it's not malicious, I don't think. It's, I don't think it's uh, an evil intent. It's just that's how humans process stuff. You've said something, my brain connected to it, so I can't wait to say my thing because that's what's going on in my brain. It's like, say your thing, say your thing, say your thing. Listen to understand. You've got to stay in that listening mode. And listening much, is much more than hearing. Um, you know, you, you can have a, 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 something, something that transmits sound and you can have an audio receptor. You can have a, a human voice and ears. That's hearing. But listening is to understand what that person is saying. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Good. All right. Let's move on. Um, using heightened emotional intelligence. All right. So this gets us into a little bit uh, of expressing emotion, which is often very, very difficult in the sciences. I would suggest it's needed because emotion is more effective at communicating. I always love to use this example, even though it's a sad example to me. The idea, the fallacy that vaccines cause autism is still persistent. And I would suggest that's because it's such an emotional story. So even though the guy that uh, Wakefield or whatever, the doctor who lost his license and uh, the journal retracted the, the story and all, all that's been debunked and uh, the data has been there for a long, long time, still this fallacy persists that vaccines can cause autism. And I don't wanna go too deep into that because I'm not educated on it. But what I would like to point out is it's an emotional context that people get hung up into. And when you see this story of a family on a talk show, you feel sympathy for the child and empathy for the family and fear that it would happen to someone in your family and, and, and anger at the doctor and rage at big pharma. I, it, it's, it's all emotion and that supersedes your ability to take in this data. And it's also data is very dense. You know, somebody who's just mad is easy to understand. So the idea of using emotional intelligence, both reading your partner's emotions, seeing how do they feel about this, if they're expressing anything, if you can read anything, and utilizing emotion yourself to better convey your own messaging, to better communicate what you want. And for a long time in the sciences, probably still, uh, it was frowned upon. And I'm sure a lot of you here are going, uh-huh, tell me more, actor boy. Uh, we have people, if scientists used emotion, they were seen as less rational and thus less credible. So for a long time, emotion was completely beaten out of science communication. I would suggest that's fine if that's your choice. Keep doing what you're doing. You will keep getting what you're getting, which is climate change that has no real significant action on it. Over 20 years of the day, the data has been out there. And what's taken uh, uh, the next step is not more IPCC reports, but a 16-year-old uh, Swedish girl who is very emotional, even though she has Asperger's. I don't know her. I don't know her emotional ability or spectrum or whatever, but she's angry for 
her whole generation. She's, uh, she's scared for what it's going to be. You know, she's, she's vengeful. I'm a little afraid of that girl. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot going on, but that's going to connect a lot better than all the data in the world. I guarantee it, right? So using emotional and height, uh, intelligence, heightened emotional intelligence, kind of the way I phrase it, um, through improv exercises is really easy. It's a tiny bit of acting. The next exercise we're gonna do, I need four volunteers, but you don't have to speak. You don't have to say anything. I'm just gonna make you, I'm gonna have you make faces. So give me four volunteers to come up, please. You don't have to say anything. Yeah, come on up. So come on up. Where's somebody? Come on up. You don't have to raise your hand. I love you guys are so uh, uh, polite. Just if you're willing to volunteer, stand up and walk. And uh, we'll put you, we'll put you here, I guess right there. Right there is good. All right. So yeah, give me one more. Thank you so much. All right. So you guys line up uh, here facing the audience, please. And I'll say hello, <laughs> Gerhard. Now that you coughed, I don't want to shake that. All right, Mark. I'm Brian. Hi, Maytal. Nice to meet you. And Mona. Mona, very nice to meet you. All right. So what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, uh, show you guys an emotional assignment. By that, I mean it'll be something I want them to portray happy, sad, proud, whatever it might be. I've got it on my little iPad, and I'll show it to you in a second. This will be a secret from the rest of the audience because I'm then going to have you try to portray that emotional tone non-verbally, non-vocally. So they can't say any words, nor can they even make any sounds. How you do that, it was body language, gesturing, or excuse me, facial expressions and gesturing. So if I were to ask you to convey the tone of happiness, you might smile and do a little happy dance or whatever it might be, right? And then we're gonna ask, they're gonna quiz the, the house, what did you get off of the emotional tone from Mona and Metal and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, does that make any sense? Yeah, we'll try it. It's, it's not that hard, was it? Just because you cough, you got to do this now. All right, so now don't reveal anything. Don't say anything out loud. Just uh, give me a nod that you can read my little handwriting on the little pad. So you got that? Everybody got that? Great, terrific. So now, uh, again, this will be about five seconds. How I'd like you in the house to uh, address this is uh, everybody on, on stage left, which is you guys, uh, look at Mona and Metal uh, because there won't be enough time for you to study everybody. So really focus on our first two, happens to be the ladies, and everybody on the right side of the room, focus on Mark and, and Gerhard uh, as they do theirs. And then afterwards, uh, I'll give you about five seconds to do this, and I'll say, great, thank you, please stop. Don't reveal anything, okay? So I'm gonna then quiz the house and see what did you get from them emotionally. And we'll just see how close we are or whatever. Obviously there's a debrief coming after that. So the big thing is don't reveal anything once I get to the guessing part, just stay silent on that. Okay, everybody got their role? You're gonna be studying uh, two of the four. Uh, uh, guys, you remember what the, the cue was? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a one, two, three, go. Then with your facial expression, with your body language, with your gestures, try to convey that emotional tone. All right, looking out, you can uh, look at individuals if you like, but I'm gonna give you a one, two, three, go. You got about five seconds, convey it. Everybody in the room is looking and we'll stop. Yay, thank you very much. Stay up here, guys. Now, without revealing anything, we'll start with the side of the room. What did we get off of Mona? What would you guys, uh, what do you think her emotional tone was? What is it? Proud. Approval? I just wanna get approval, proud. There's no right or wrong, guys, just yell. Was it stern? What was it? <laughs> Existential despair. To, to the guy who couldn't find the right door. Thank you very much. And then, any, anything else? So, stern, existential dis despair, approving, uh, proud, anything else? Confident, excellent. Okay, so that was all for you, Mona. Try to remember those when you cry yourself to sleep tonight. Now, Maytal, uh, what do we get off of? Uh, Maytai? Maytal, 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 pardon me. Uh, what do we get off of Maytal? Stand office, yeah, great. There's no right or wrong, guys. It's, no, no, hang on, anything else? Confident, excellent. Anybody else? What is it? Well, I, I, not impressed? Very good, that's totally, totally valuable. All right, great, so thank you. Remember those, we'll come back to it. Now for the, the lads, everybody here, what we get off of Mark emotionally? Impatient. Well, encouraging, right? Anybody else? I told you. <laughs> Get that lot. Yeah, shout it out, please. Judgy. Judgy. Good, good. Excellent. Anybody else? Sarcastic. Sarcastic. What was it? Agreeing. Good. Excellent. And what we get off of Gerhard? Gerhard, pardon me. Disappointed. Disappointed. What? Boredom. Boredom. Yeah, right? Snobby. Snobby. Good. <laughs> Great. Excellent. This all may just read as German. I'm not sure where you're going. <laughs> so good. So now for the, uh, the four participants, what were you trying to convey, please? All the 
Confidence. Give a lot of love. Yay. Have a seat. Have a seat and we'll debrief it. Thank you very much for getting up here. It takes a lot of courage to get up in front of people when you don't know what you're going to be asked to do. So I really appreciate all four of you doing that. Now, the takeaway of this simple exercise is how we think we're presenting ourselves is often not how we are perceived, all right? So you are in a position, uh, uh, wherever you are, whatever position you're in, uh, of some expertise, I imagine. You're expected to know your job. You're expected to be confident about what you uh, work on and what you work with, I, I'm sure. However, if your display of confidence comes across as, uh, as snobby and, and, and disapproving and arrogant and bored and existentially crisis, uh, <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as you are perceived that way, it works against your communication. It is not clear. And if this is a universal problem. The solution is going to be a couple of little dumb uh, emotional exercises we're going to do in a second. I say dumb very lovingly. But this is a big big issue. A lot of us uh, uh, don't know how we come across, and that's normal. Even if you see yourself on video, you've got your idea of what you were doing in your mind. You know how you thought were trying to present yourself. You don't know how others are perceiving you. It's very, very difficult, and it's a universal human challenge. I've done this exercise as a participant many times, and I'm a professional actor, so I like to think of myself as good at it. Uh, one of the cues I had was warmth a person who was warm, uh, cheery, I guess. Uh, but warmth, I, I did uh, my presentation of warmth and it was a one-on-one -on -one partnership and the woman who was my partner said that I was creepy. So, <laughs> uh, so A, she's wrong. B, that is what taught me this lesson. Because in my mind, I'm a Muppet, man. I love everybody, I wanna hug everybody. Is In my mind, I, I think I'm, I'm effusively positive. I think I, I, I'm the poster boy for charm, yet I was seen as creepy. So that, uh, it, it taught me that lesson. So now I wear a lot of light blue gingham and I try to smile more and I gesture with my hands open. I, I, so I have trained myself to try to do some things to help myself in this perception because my genetics dictate a resting grump face. This is me when I'm completely satisfied and happy. That's it. I, I don't express a whole lot, right? So I've had, I've had to train myself to express more. Uh, uh, gesturing helps. And that you, can, you can get into the weeds on what kind of gestures because palms up are uh, uh, not threatening. Palms down are somewhat threatening because don't, you don't know if you're hiding something. Fingers are horrible because they, they uh, are intimidating or threatening also, blah, blah, blah. You can get real deep into all of these metrics. But the point is, I didn't know that I ever read as creepy, and I'm sure I've been a lot of times in my life. So that taught me, right? You've got to put effort into how you express yourself. Now, we're going to get up and do a tiny exercise uh, uh, having all of you practice uh, an emotional expression. Don't stand up yet. I'll tell you the mechanics of it. We'll get everybody up, stand up, partner with somebody on the other side. So use a different partner from the last letter game. and. I'm going to give the whole room an assignment, such as uh, excited or grief-stricken. There's only going to do a couple of these. And the goal here is, or the process rather, is to just say letters of the alphabet sequentially. So you don't have to think of words. You don't have to think of last letters. You don't have to, you could just put your energy into how do I express excited. Body, face, gestures, and now we are adding the voice to this. So those components kind of make holistic communication. Uh, in acting, a lot of times we say, put it in your body. And that kind of means I want to see it on your face and see your gestures and see your body language, make eye contact or avoid eye contact. All these are sort of physical components towards communication. So this tiny exercise is going to be the emotional alphabet. That's all this is. A, B, C, D, whilst playing the assignment that I give to you. Is that any questions on the mechanics of that? Let's stand up and find a new partner. Um, and again, it can be trios, or just you go in order. I'm gonna to have to, uh, I'm gonna to have to scream over you a little bit. So I'll, let's say uh, this first assignment, everybody. And again, this is, you get extra points for being courageous enough to even do this because it's very anxiety producing, but everybody's in the same boat. Improv is a great equalizer because none of you are gonna be Meryl Streep, all right? So it's, it's, it's really easy to just do your best and there's no right or wrong way to express anything. I'll talk about that a little bit after. So what we'll do is I'll assign an emotion and we'll do the first six letters, A through G, whatever it is, right? Then stop and I'll assign you another emotion. We'll do six more letters. So in that way, we'll do maybe four or five emotions, okay? So facing your partner because eye contact and body language starts with that. 
uh, determine who is A, and just to go back and forth A, B, C. A will literally start with the letter A, and your first emotional assignment will start down so we can bring it up, is I want you to play grief-stricken, right? So that's not just sad, it's grief-stricken. It's really, really hard to do, right? But we're gonna turn it around after six letters. Both people will do the same emotion, but alternating letters. So uh, uh, any other questions on the mechanics? All right, facing each other, grief stricken. A starts with A, and when you get through G, stop after G, and begin. Really show it, put it on your face, put it in your body. Change your voice, what's the intonation? Where's your volume? Oh, okay. All right, stop it there. Let's do, uh, let's turn it around, and now let's, let's do ecstatic. All right, so you just got funded. You just cured cancer. You just, the Saints won the Super Bowl. Anything that really excites you, right? Good, go, go. Thank you. I want to say two. Yeah, yeah. It was in my thing. Uh, you, were, you were doing your interview. Okay, let's stop it there. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yes, sit down, sit down. Right now? Okay, all right. So I'll finish the emotional thing. All right, so very quickly, uh, there's no right or wrong way to play an emotion. A lot of people get hung up on, it's like, well, I don't know how to express grief. I've had students uh, literally take out their phone and Google how to express ecstasy. You know? There's no right or wrong way, nor there's, there, is there probably a tutorial. There are, somebody of course came back to me with their metrics. There are uh, X amount of muscles in the face. And if you wanna show excitement, these muscles go up and these, so you, if you wanna get that deep in it, you can. But really that's a waste of time, just intuitively. However you express a feeling, that's the right way. So you're not putting energy into faking yourself. You just wanna ex express it. This was faking. But again, content doesn't matter, mechanics matter. Just the idea that you should emote. If you feel it, reveal it. And I hate little rhyming mnemonics like that, but I, people tend to remember it. So if you feel it, reveal it. Again, it's situational. You can't always do this. If you're, if you're talking to the, the boss, if you're talking to the Pentagon, if you're pitching uh, uh, fundraisers, stakeholders, whatever, situational, use it. But using emotion will always be a higher percentage choice communicatively than not. Ready? you had a quickie thing? <laughs> it's incredible. Um, no, I just want to say a few words about this guy. So 20 years ago, I reached out to the Groundlings Improv Comedy Theater in Hollywood when I was making science films and knew the importance of improv and began searching through their whole program looking for the right match and worked with about 25 of the actors, some of whom became major stars. Melissa McCarthy was in the same group with Brian and lots of other stars, Kristen Wiig on not. Um, and he was the guy I eventually found that actually was really interested. He came to me one day after we did a little scene and said, uh, could we go to lunch? I'm interested in hearing about your transition from marine biology to what you do with filmmaking. So over the last 10 years, I've been working with him. And 10 years ago, he couldn't even pronounce a lot of science words. I and do. it was doubly comical. Um, but he's to now you. working, with, yeah, to me, exactly. But he's now working with a lot of science organizations to become and that's very important because, you know, you can find local improv instructors that you might want to have them come work with your students. But if they don't have a little bit of orientation to what the science world's like, they don't quite know how to put this stuff into context. Um, he's got a ton of it. And I would encourage all of you in your home institutions, if you've got any interest, I mean, he's the best. That's all I can say about it. And feel free to, you know, if you took down my email address, send me an email if you want to ask some questions about him. I'll serve, not as his agent, but I'd be glad to kind of help mediate. If, you, if you're wondering, you know, how could we use a guy like that rather than having to awkwardly ask him the questions, you can uh, funnel him through me. But uh, that's all I can say. In, in all my years, he's really absolutely as good as you see right here. So take it away. Thank you, sir. I, we're almost out of time. I'm going to give one last thing on the emotion, all right? Emojis were created to add emotional context to a text-only medium. That's how important emotions are. So if you get a text that said, gonna get you tonight, you can read that any way you want. If it came with a background of hearts and, and uh, <laughs> drooling and, and a winky face, it probably means something romantic and positive, gonna get you tonight with this context or this context. <laughs> 
So it's, 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 really, it's really sort of cliche, but it's not, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Again, off of Randy's thing this morning in the keynote, when you, if you're in your inner circle, then you can just say, spew facts and data all you want. Your inner circle will get it. If you're speaking to anybody outside of your exact esoteric splendid thing that you study, then you need to use these other communicative uh, techniques to help you be more effective. All right, uh, that's my time, basically. Uh, the last thing was this yes and idea. Again, it's not an algorithm. Yes. I'm gonna take another four hours, so sit down. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's give you the benefit of doing this exercise. All right, so there's a yes and exercise. And Catherine, would you please demo it with me again? You didn't know we we're gonna do it, but yeah. Uh, just don't give me that terrible commentary that you gave me. All right. So uh, we're going to improvise a short scene just with dialogue. So how it works is I'm going to offer something such as the alien uh, saved the kid, and she's going to yes and it. Now you literally have to use the transitional phrase, yes, and. Then she'll say something. She'll just make something else, improvise the next line, just one line at a time. So it might look uh, like this. Uh, the, the kids ran into the playground. Yes, and they threw a paper airplane. Yes, and the airplane disinfected. Yes, and a raccoon skittered out of the trash can. Yes, and the raccoon ate my lunch. Fantastic, sit down. Yay, thank you, Catherine. All right, that's a good little story, actually. Uh, if you sell that, I get half of it. All right, so I want you to stand up, pair up, and do this exercise. And I'll walk you through it a little bit more specifically, but again, the content doesn't matter. People usually get hung up on raccoon and trash can and uh, paper airplane. The content almost doesn't matter, guys. It's just the mechanics of open body language, eye contact with your partner, listening to understand them. Then with this orientation of agreement, the yes and thing helps you practice. Great, we're working on this thing together. We're trying to build a thing together, right? That hopefully will speak to consensus building, which I didn't touch on at all. But uh, uh, in your world of gateways and stuff, you know, building something together when you've got a lot of different brains. So don't worry about the content. It's just the mechanics of listening to your partner, forcing yourself to agree with them, and then adding to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll get some, we'll get some questions after. Uh, and we can release people, and then I'll stick around, and we'll do a little Q&A as much. All right, so get up, get up and pair up. We're going to do the yes and game, and it's only going to be five or six lines each. So uh, I think you get that it's not that demanding. Still, people are going to be anxious. I understand. Don't worry about the content. Just practice mechanics. Facing each other, I'm going to give everybody the first opening line. So I'll give the opening line to you. So everybody decide who's A and who's B. A. A will begin by repeating the line I give. B will then initiate the game by using the transitional phrase, yes, and, and then make something up that connects to your partner, right? Then A goes back to using yes, and as well. So after that first statement, it's always got to begin with yes, and. So all the A's looking at your partners are going to begin by repeating this. Last month, I went scuba diving. Go. <laughs> Good. Popular. You had too many people. Oh, no, it's, it's great. I love it. Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can stop it there. I know. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. I, I love it. You guys couldn't, couldn't, obviously couldn't see Catherine's face, but when I, I said stop it there, she looked at me like, oh, we're just getting going. Was, yeah. I, it was, this was just fun. Uh, and that was all conveyed with emotional expression on your face. All right, so I hope you had fun with it. Again, the content doesn't matter. The mechanics of working with someone. Again, not an algorithm. In your real life, you're not gonna be able to say yes to everything. There are very few things probably you just blanket yes. But that orientation of agreement is important for communicating. It, it gets you into a mindset of, I want to communicate with this person, with these others. I want to work with them so that we, we join, boy, uh, join, <laughs> join. Uh, so we build something together, right? Um, so that's kind of the idea behind that. This was such a brief taste of these exercises, guys. Uh, but I, I hope you'll treat this yes and, if not as an algorithm, as a heuristic. Something that, that, that encourages you to go look into it further and find games you can do on your own. And just search it. There's endless amounts of uh, ubiquitous uh, improv stuff. Very briefly, 
Uh, improv does a lot more for communication, but what we touched on today, uh, heightened engagement from the uh, uh, heightened emotional intelligence, holistic presentation, and the listening stuff. There's a lot of other facets to it, as you might imagine. Um, this is my contact information, so Randy was nice enough to pimp me out, but you can hit me up directly uh, if you so choose. And please uh, uh, share the slides. I think they will, uh, and it's on Zoom, and take a picture of it. I had a whole story about how my kid took my business cards, but really, I just left them in my other bag. So uh, you can take a picture of that now. Open the Q&A, and it's also kind of the official end of the session, so if people need to sneak out, I totally get it. I won't be insulted, but uh, quick questions. You wanted to start with something, yell it out. Catherine, don't hurt yourself. Oh, okay. oh right. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so most of us probably, or most of the professors in here probably teach as well. Yes. So um, how do you implement this when a student is like totally wrong? <laughs> but you want them to continue to have the confidence to continue to ask questions. Good. This is an excellent question has come up before. And uh, the, the answer I found to be probably the most applicable is you have to correct the information. You can't let them believe that they're, the, the, whatever their incorrect information is correct. But you can do it with a smile on your face and encouragement. Just play, instead of playing grief stricken or ecstatic or whatever I gave you, play encouraging. Even if you just put that in your brain and you never say the word out loud, it's like, excellent question. You got the facts wrong, but keep going with it. Keep digging into it, you know, find it, blah, blah, blah. So it more the encouraging attitude would probably be my suggestion on how to uh, deal with someone who's got incorrect facts, but you want to keep them encouraged, play encouraged. And I don't mean play, you know, don't make a big thing out of it, but if you feel it, reveal it. Show that you're encouraging that kid. And however it comes across from you, will be right. There's no right or wrong way to play encouragement at all, right? So if you think, oh, I'm not good with conveying my emotions on my face, if you put any effort into it, it'll be better than not, right? So I'd say play encouragement in that moment. Any Anybody else? Questions? Yeah, up, up here or wherever. So how do you deal with people who have an agenda, yep. such as, let us say, union leaders? They are playing for the audience. They don't really mean what they are saying, but uh, you have to face them. So how do you do that? Or maybe facing them is not the right way. Yeah. If I could answer that, I wouldn't be here. I would be, I would, I would be in charge of the world. All right. So all this stuff is situational. All this stuff is uh, minute. I mean, how do you better your chances of communicating with people using some of these techniques? But it is absolutely not a magic wand. It is not a cure-all. If someone's got an agenda, and this question's come up as well. It's an excellent question. You're, you're probably not going to be able to convince them. You're probably not going to be able to uh, uh, get them to change their mind on something. So this is not, especially the improv aspect, this is not um, persuasion. It is collaboration and best practices of communication. So I wish I had a better answer for you, I swear. But the, a lot of people will have agendas. And a lot of people are funded. Uh, there's you know, merchants of doubt out there and all that stuff. I mean, there's a lot of problems in the world. And we can't fix them all with improv. This is baby steps towards better communication. One more question. Is there one up here? Yeah. Uh, somebody had. They talk. So how do you deal with sort of gender issues, the same Big. facial expression, the same body position, the same wording, can yes, come excellent. across very differently if it comes out of a man or a woman's mouth? Very much so. And uh, again, that's another one. Is like, I wish I had an answer for that. I wish I had a solution for that. There's not a quick fix to it, but it's an absolutely big thing to bring up and talk about. Women in the sciences, when they show any emotion, they're automatically, they've got 5,000 years of whatever our species history is of, she's emotional, she's less rational, she's less credible. That, that's the, you know, all the women are not. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's a big, big problem and you've got to calibrate your own. You know, how, how, how can you effectively show that you are invested in this and you care about this issue and still maintain your credibility as a scientist who's got all this data to back it? I don't have a ready answer to that. Most of you have questions that I don't have a ready answer for. The improv training is just to help you with communication. It's like the narrative stuff Randy was talking about. It takes time. And uh, yeah, so that's a big thing to bring up 
and recognized. But I'm encouraged. Uh, in the past 10 years, I've gotten that question at almost every. I'm sorry. No, I'm pointing at you. Uh, <laughs> I've gotten that question at almost every science event I've done. And at least it's being talked about. The very first ones that Randy brought me to, there's a lot of old white guys standing with their arms crossed and just shaking their head no at, all, at me. It's like, I don't care. Um, but it's there. It's a part of this world, right? Um, keep attacking it and, and calibrate your own use of emotion, I would say. And also it's situational. Know your audience. Are, are you speaking to someone that's probably going to be open to that or not and calibrate it that way? Let me add one little case study that I don't, I've been updating on this lately, but one of the first things I brought him to was about 10 years ago, the National Park Service in Colorado. Yeah. And we did improv with them and my good friend there, Kurt Fristrup, who I just saw this summer, updated me on this. But he ran through, um, you know, we did the whole workshop and everything in improv. And then it was a couple of years later, I was talking with Kurt. He said, you wouldn't believe how many times we'd been in conference rooms and meetings working on an idea and everybody gets into negating mode and they start poking holes in this idea and you can feel the plane just go Culture circling no. down, going down, exactly. And he said, one day, I finally stopped the whole thing. I said, remember that thing that Brian taught us about the SN? Let's just try that for a minute here. And he said, it was like, you could feel the plane start going back up. Yes, and maybe we could do this, maybe we could do this. And it's that sort of dynamic that the improv stuff sometimes can reverse the whole dynamic. Because I lived through that many times in conference meetings with scientists where you get going on that, everybody's critical mind is at work and you don't realize, wow, we're just shredding an entire concept here. So that's a, a practical application of it. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll be around for a couple of minutes if anyone wants to talk, but we should wrap it, I guess. Or, or, thank you so much. I appreciate it, you guys. Thank you for attending.